Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Harry Kazianis. I serve as the Director of Defense Studies here at the Center for the National Interest in Washington, D.C. Welcome to our friends here with us in the flesh, as well as those who are joining us on Facebook Live and as well as C-SPAN 3. Today, we present to you a real treat, a not one but two-part discussion on U.S. missile defense policy. Part one will be with the gentleman sitting next to me here on my right, Senator Tom Cotton from Arkansas. Part two, after Senator Cotton's keynote address, as well as Q&A session, will be what I hope is a lively debate on missile defense with Joe Serencione from Plowshares and Rebecca Heinrichs from the Hudson Institute. Now, I'm going to keep my remarks very brief as we want to spend as much time with Senator Cotton as possible. Obviously, it goes without saying that Washington is faced with severe challenges when it comes to missiles and the proliferation of missiles throughout the world. Uh, obviously, North Korea is very much in the news due to the developments of its short, medium, and long-range ballistic missiles and the abilities to actually, at some point, hit the homeland. Uh, Senator Cotton has been at the forefront of advocating for a robust missile defense strategy. His remarks today will be around 20 minutes or so. After that, we'll open the floor to questions for about 25 minutes. Please keep in mind during the Q&A to state your name and affiliation, as we are very much on the record, as you can see by the different cameras here. Also, as time is limited, please keep your question as compact and precise as possible. With that, Senator Cotton, the floor is yours. Thank you, Harry. Thank you all for joining us today to discuss this very important topic. The defense of the homeland is the most basic premise of American grand strategy, and it has been since before this country was founded. If you read the Bill of Particulars in the Declaration of Independence, you'll see one of the complaints was that the king was not protecting American citizens from attacks on our own land. This has been a consistent theme since our founding in the Revolutionary War in American strategic discussions, uh, whether it was the sacking of Washington and the burning of the White House during the War of 1812, the premise of the Monroe Doctrine that we wouldn't let powers from the old world have a salient into the new world from which they could threaten the homeland. The Cuban Missile Crisis uh, was resolved in part by the U.S. making commitment that we would not attack Cuba again, absent the deployment of offensive weapons capable of striking our homeland. And after the 9-11 attacks, the world saw the kind of response that the American people demand when our citizens are attacked on our own soil. It's also one reason why we have all those forward deployed bases in places like Europe and the Middle East and East Asia on the Eurasian Rimland. Yes, it's to assure our allies and to help defend them, but more than anything, it's forward defense for the United States and our citizens and our territory so that if any war is going to be fought, it's going to be fought as an away game on our enemy's turf, not a home game on our turf. That's why missile defense is a must-have technology for our military, not a nice to have one. It's only becoming more so in the uh, future because our rivals are continuing to advance their ballistic and cruise missile technology. I divide the threats that we face uh, into short-term and long-term. Short-term threats, obviously, is North Korea. Longer-term threats are countries like Iran, Russia, and China as they de develop and deploy more advanced systems. As a preview, I'd say there are four things we need to do to counteract these threats. First, and most simply, is to increase our defense spending. Second is to spend some of that additional money on integrated, layered, ballistic missile defense systems. Third is to help our allies develop their own missile defense systems. And fourth is to reconsider and reevaluate the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. First, let me turn to the threats that we face. First and most immediate, North Korea. As Secretary Jim Mattis said recently uh, in testimony to Congress, North Korea is the most urgent and dangerous threat to peace and security that we face. This year alone, the North Korea has been test firing two or three short and medium range ballistic missiles per month. They're working on submarine launch ballistic missile technology as well. Everyone agrees it's only a matter of time before the North Koreans can flight test an intercontinental missile capable of hitting not just Hawaii or Alaska, but United States mainland. That's why President Obama warned President-elect Trump during the transition that North Korea was the most urgent crisis he might face. I should hasten to add that even if North Korea struggles to miniaturize nuclear technology, their attack uh, in the Kuala Lumpur airport reminded the world, too, that they have vast stores of chemical and biological weapons, which can also be delivered by missile technology. One also must worry about the reliability of North Korea's nuclear command and control systems. They are developing, for instance, road mobile and potentially submarine launched ballistic missiles. One must wonder whether or not those commanders will have full, will be under the full control of North Korea's national leadership in a crisis. Second, 
Iran. Since the jo Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action was signed, Iran has tested ballistic missiles on at least 14 different occasions. The IRGC fired ballistic missiles into eastern Syria last week in an attempt to strike ISIS targets. I would suggest they were trying to send a signal to both the United States and Israel. Moreover, there are credible reports that Iran is supporting ballistic missile technology development in Yemen through their proxies, the Houthis. Finally, by the time Iran's nuclear deal sun requirement sunset, I would suggest they hope to have reliable delivery systems for any nuclear weapons program. Third, a country that sometimes escapes notice is Pakistan. One cannot discount the possibility that one of Pakistan's over 100 nuclear weapons might fall out of the country, out of that government's control, and potentially into the hands of extremists. And of course, a loose nuclear weapon in the hands of a terrorist group is exactly the kind of threat ballistic missile systems is designed to stop. Next is Russia. As everyone here is well aware, Russians, the Russians still maintain the world's largest inventory of nuclear warheads. Russia has also tested and deployed a ground-launched cruise missile that violates the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. General Silva, the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, testified this year to Congress that the Russians have, quote, violated the spirit and intent of the INF Treaty, and they do not intend to return to compliance. He also said, quote, the system itself presents a risk to most of our facilities in Europe. In other words, Russia is violating a treaty from which they receive greater benefit to the United States and therefore need more without paying any consequences. China, the PLA Navy, has fielded four SSBNs, giving Beijing a critical credible sea-based nuclear deterrent. China also is not a member to the INF Treaty. Therefore, they have developed a number of dual-use missile variants in the 500 to 5,500 kilometer range that contribute to their anti-access area denial strategy in East Asia. Moreover, both Russia and China are blurring the doctrinal separation between nuclear and conventional weapons use. Some may say that ballistic missile defenses are provocative to our adversaries because it could disturb the balance of deterrence. But I would say the balance is already being disturbed by these te technological advances as well as these blurred doctrinal lines. Russia sees theater weapons and limited nuclear use against conventional military targets as a way to escalate to de-escalate in their terms, to end a conventional conflict on favorable terms for Russia. China, likewise, is beginning to rethink its no first use doctrine, which can occur, of course, at any point, up to the decision to use nuclear weapons in a crisis. And Chinese military journals discuss the use of nuclear weapons as a higher level component of the anti-access aerial denial strategy in the Western Pacific. With regard to China, I also must note, out, must note that we have to deal with the fact that the size and the quality of its nuclear forces remain largely a mystery to us, as we have little transparency on what nuclear weapons they may have produced and whether and how they are concealed. Deterring what we don't know about, of course, is a very difficult task. If our adversaries are contemplating the use of nuclear forces as part of normal warfare, then I would suggest we'd be best advised to develop ballist ballistic missile defenses instead of clinging to a deterrence framework that they have already discarded. So what ought we do about all these threats? Well, first, as I said, the most fundamental decision we have is increasing our defense budget. And with that comes the requirement of repealing the Budget Control Act. The Budget Control Act was passed in 2011 in a very different world than we face now. Congress has repeatedly made it clear that they cannot abide by those limits. After spending caps went into effect briefly in 2013, Congress passed a two-year budget, followed by an omnibus, followed by an omnibus. Congress did that again in 2015. Congress does not act to repeal the Budget Control Act. I predict that we will see a continuing resolution in September, another two-year budget in the fall, another omnibus this December, another omnibus in December 2018, and then we will repeat that cycle once again in the 2019-2020 phase. That will not save money because spending caps will increase, but it will also not mean wise investments because our military will not have the kind of long-term stability and predictability they need. 
Only 47 senators were in office in 2011 to vote for that bill. The 112th Congress was not the Constitutional Convention. The Budget Control Act is not the Constitution. The Budget Control Act must be repealed. How much should we spend that money? We have a lot of needs, a lot of conventional needs, a lot of needs to modernize our nuclear forces. But the threats that we face also require that we accelerate the deployment of integrated and layered ballistic missile defense systems that incorporate forward-based assets with space sensors and ground-based interceptors in the United States and begin to explore, explore airborne systems as well. In the short term, we need to be able to stop the limited ICBM attack threat from states like North Korea and potentially Iran. Over the long term, though, I would suggest that we need to be able to stop an attack from near-peer adversaries as well. So I was pleased last to see the Missile Defense Agency's successful ground-based interceptor test last month that destroyed an incoming missile from the Pacific. We're now on track to have 44 ground-based interceptors deployed by the end of the year. To accelerate our ballistic missile defense progress, I've co-sponsored the Advancing American Missile Defense Act along with Senator Sullivan, Cruz, Rubio, Capito, Manchin, Peters, and Schatz, a bipartisan group of senators who recognize the threats that we face, some of whom own citizens face it the most gravely. This legislation will authorize another 28 ground-based interceptors. It would accelerate the development and deployment of advanced interceptor technologies, as well as the development and deployment of a space-based sensor layer. It also accelerate the environmental impact statement for our interceptor site on the East Coast, as well as one in the Midwest of the United States. And it would require a DOD report on the possibility of up to 100 ground-based interceptors distributed across the United States and ask for the specifics about optimal locations and the possibilities of transport and the possibility of transportable ground-based interceptors. In addition, I think the Missile Defense Agency should rapidly develop and demonstrate an airborne unmanned air aerial vehicle boost phase intercept capability. The concept here would be to involve, would involve high altitude, long endurance UAVs equipped with laser payloads, loitering for days at a time. UAV rotations would be managed by a ground crew. Why would we do this? Well, intercepting a missile in the boost phase before it achieves mid-course is, of course, the holy grail of ballistic missile defense. Because the missile is moving slower, it's therefore easier to track, and it's still intact. No decoys or debris have deployed to complicate targeting the warhead. It also, of course, is over its enemy, the enemy territory, not over our territory. All these things combined make it increase the probability of an intercept and the impact of an intercept. The concept is, of course, challenging, mainly due to technology. However, the technology is rapidly advancing, and I believe with more investment and exploration, it is a feasible concept. Third, we need to encourage our allies to deploy their own ballistic missile defense systems. Four deployed U.S. missile defense systems and allied ballistic missile defense information sharing supports our goals of protecting the homeland, extended deterrence, and assurance of our allies. The United States has deployed two THAAD launchers to South Korea, but the new South Korean government has delayed the deployment of four additional THAAD systems in an attempt to appease China and their intimidation of South Korea. The Japanese are currently debating whether to deploy either the THAAD system or the Aegis Shore system. We should encourage them, just as we should encourage our allies in the Middle East United Arab Emirates has already purchased the THAAD system. The United States has approved for sale to Qatar and Saudi Arabia THAAD systems as well, all to develop layered ballistic missile defense threats from Iran. In Europe, it has been uh, one year since NATO deployed Aegis Shore to Romania. Construction is also underway on a Polish Aegis Shore site, and four Aegis-capable U.S. destroyers are currently based in Rota, Spain. All of these developments, plus more could be on the way, will help develop or help create the kind of layered theater system that our troops and nationals, as well as our allies and their citizens need. Fourth and final, I suggest it's time to reevaluate the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. 
If Russia is going to test and deploy intermediate-range cruise missiles, then logic dictates that we must respond. After all, as I said, Russia benefits more from the INF Treaty than does the United States, unless we believe that Canada or Mexico are going to develop intermediate-range missiles anytime soon, or that we would allow them to be deployed to Cuba, none of which I would imagine would happen. Yet Russia is violating with impunity a treaty from which they benefit more than do we. It's obvious that pleading with Vladimir Putin's regime to uphold its treaty obligations has not brought Russia back into compliance, nor is it likely to do so. Therefore, strengthening our deterrent and our specifically our ballistic missile deterrent in Russia very well might. The commander of Pacific Command, Harry Harris, recently testified that we should take a look at renegotiating the treaty because it has become, in his words, a unilateral limitation on us. Since the United States and Russia are the only two nations who are part of that treaty and Russia is violating it, the United States is the only country on Earth that is not at least exploring, if not developing, and actu actively deploying cruise and ballistic missiles in the range of 500 to 5,500 kilometers. That's why I propose the Intermediate Range Forces Treaty Preservation Act, all aimed at taking steps that are permissible within the INF Treaty, but also to pressure Iran or Russia to come back into compliance. The legislation would establish a program of record for a dual-capable, road-mobile ground-launched missile system with INF ranges and facilitate the transfer of INF range systems to allied countries. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, under Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan, the United States successfully used such a dual-track approach to bring the Soviet Union, Soviet Union to the INF negotiating table. It would, the legislation would further limit funds on New START extension or Open Sky Treaty activities until Russia returns to compliance with the INF Treaty. These are just a few of the steps I think we should take to face the growing threat or to counteract the growing threat that we face from our adversaries missile technology and deployment advances. There's no doubt more that we could, but at this point I'm happy to turn to Harry for questions and then to each of you. Great, great. Well, thank you, Senator. Um, let me use moderator's privilege to, to ask the first question, then I'll open it up to the audience. Um, listening to your remarks, Senator, I kept thinking about North Korea. I mean, obviously very much in the news. Uh, there was rumors circulating on Friday and over the weekend that because the over the weekend on the 25th, we had the anniversary of the North Korean, um, the war with North Korea in the 1950s, that there could be a nuclear test. So let's say, for example, North Korea were to test an ICBM. What do you think would be the appropriate response from the Trump administration? Do you think we should use our missile defenses and, and take it out? Would it be a better idea to observe it? What do you think would be the best approach? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, so I, I won't speculate on hypotheticals, and I'll leave some of those questions uh, sure. to our military experts. Um, but we should bring every pressure to bear we can on North Korea to deter them from deter doing just that. Um, I have to say, I, I don't think China has done much um, in the last six months, or for that matter, the last 30 years, in trying to deter this uh, threat from North Korea. They continue to try to have it both ways, uh, and there's much more that we could do in terms of sanctions. Uh, against North Korea's illicit network, as well as businesses and individuals in China uh, who's facilitating North Korea's military and their ballistic missile technology developments. Um, that said, in the same time, we've got to continue to uh, take prudent precautions. We should be working with the new Moon administration in Seoul to hopefully deploy the remaining THAAD systems to encourage Japan to take whatever course they choose and deem most appropriate for their own self-defense and the defense of our uh, soldiers and sailors and airmen and marine in theater, whether it's the THAAD system or the Aegis system. Um, there are steps left that, to be taken uh, that uh, we have not yet taken with North Korea before we simply cede to the choice between accepting North Korea as a nuclear armed state that can hold at risk United S the, the states of the United States of America um, or uh, having to fight another Korean War. Okay, fair enough. Well, with that, it is question and answer time. So please keep in mind to, to state your affiliation when you a ask your question. Uh, we'll open it up. You were first, ma'am, please. If we can get a microphone, that would be great. Right behind you. Thank you very much. Katrina Manson from the Financial Times. Thanks for having me. I wanted to ask the basis for your aim to have 100 interceptors um, and what you make of the risk of so many of the current interceptors deployed 
uh, being first and second generation, which have been shown to have technical problems? Well, I, uh, I think we need more interceptors. Um, obviously, if North Korea develops a intercontinental missile, um, or if there's another missile threat to our homeland, uh, yeah. you don't want to have one interceptor for one missile. Uh, the success rate is growing, but the success rate is unlikely to ever be perfect or 100 percent, and therefore we need to increase the number of interceptors we have. Um, in terms of the technology, um, obviously, as I said, I was pleased to see the successful test um, earlier this month over the Pacific. Of course, the question to ask on these tests is not whether it was a success or a failure, but what we learned, because uh, you learn from success or from failure. Um, if we're succeeding with first or second generation interceptors, that's a good thing, but it also leads to more lessons learned that might create future generation as well. Richard, please. Wait, wait for a microphone, Richard, if you don't mind. Thank you. Uh, Richard White, Senior Fellow at Hudson Institute. Following on that, I would think that one way uh, you could make the best use of any additional interceptors as well as the existing ones is improving the kill vehicle. Now, some you've laid out some long-term objectives, but it might be useful to think about having the redesigned kill vehicle at least as an interim step towards that process. I would agree. We had some other, go ahead, please. We can get her a mic right over there. Thank you. Hi, Rachel Oswald, Congressional Quarterly. You spoke earlier um, about Russia and China blurring the lines between conventional and nuclear weapons use. What does that have any um, impact on your thoughts on whether the U.S. should develop the new uh, LRSO, which uh, as critics have worried will also confuse the two? Uh, no, of course we need to develop the new long-range standoff cruise missile. Um, our current outcomes, air launch cruise missiles, um, are soon to be reaching their shelf life. Um, we are developing a new B-21 bomber, but I think it would be unwise to assume that throughout the multi-decade life of that aircraft, that it's always going to be able to evade the most complex air defenses and reach the interior of our country, of our adversaries' territories. Uh, in addition, uh, the B-52, uh, with the right kind of modernization, uh, can be deployed for many decades to come. Obviously, the B-52 cannot penetrate the air defense systems of our adversaries, and a new long-range standoff cruise missile uh, is essential for making the B-52 a viable part of our nuclear triad. Uh, that's why almost every flag officer who's testified in front of the Armed Services Committee has said that the long-range standoff cruise missile is a vital part of our nuclear triad, in addition to the B-21 uh, and the Ohio-class replacement uh, and the ground-based strategic deterrent. Jacob Halbert. Jacob Heilbrunn, The National Interest. Thanks for coming, Senator. Thank you. Snappy uh, suit. <laughs> I had a, uh, a broader question for you in, in listening to your remarks is, what country do you think poses overall the greatest threat to American security right now? Well, it's, it's a good question, but the answer to that question always is something like asking how many adversaries can dance on the head of a pin because all of our adversaries pose serious threats. So as a, the most immediate threat, you might say North Korea, um, you might say Iran, or some of the terror networks that a country like Iran supports, or a non-state actor like Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State. Those are all reasonable answers to your question. Um, at the same time, Russia is a very reasonable answer to your question, because Russia at this point, um, absent massive strategic surprise from China, is the only country that has the nuclear arsenal capable of destroying our way of life. Um, and Russia, over the last several years, has made it clear uh, that they are remain a hostile power uh, and that Vladimir Putin doesn't think the Soviet Union or Russia lost the Cold War. They were simply behind at halftime and are working quickly to make up the difference. So much so that you might ask today whether um, Russia is better poised to get to France or get to Spain than they were in the late stage of the Cold War. So there's different ways of looking at that question. Um, the takeaway, though, from the fact that I, I think it's hard to, to pinpoint a single threat that is the gravest threat we face, is that our military needs to be agile and flexible and dominant in every domain and region. And part of that dominance is missile defense, not just to protect our deployed troops, but as I said at the outset, to protect the U.S. homeland, which is the most basic premise of American strategy. Christina Long. Hi, Senator. Good to see you. Um, 
two areas, uh, North Korea and um, the INF, um, or North, nor North Korea. Do you think it's time to give up on China, China's trying to get China to help with North Korea? What more pressure can be applied? What do you make of the president's tweet on China? Um, how do you think the administration is handling it so far? And on the INF, would leaving the INF uh, spark a new um, arms race? Thank you. It's better to win an arms race than lose a war. So that's really in the hands of Vladimir Putin and the Russian leadership. Uh, they're the ones that are violating the INF Treaty. They're the ones that have deployed a road mobile uh, intermediate range cruise missile uh, that is extremely destabilizing uh, in Europe uh, and potentially in the Middle East and East Asia as well. Um, my legislation is designed to bring Russia back into compliance with the INF Treaty. Uh, again, Russia needs the INF Treaty more than we need them. Uh, one reason they came to the negotiating table is that once we deployed intermediate range missiles to Europe in 1983 uh, on a policy that started under the Carter administration and was continued under the Reagan administration, they, rec they recognized just how grave the threat was to them. Again, the United States faces a much more limited threat from intermediate range missiles. Uh, Russia also gets much more from the Open Skies Treaty than does the United States, yet Russia continues to violate the Open Skies Treaty. Uh, and Russia is likely to want to extend the New START Treaty. Uh, we have many points of pressure uh, that we can bring to bear on Russia to get them back into compliance with the INF Treaty. Now, even if we do get them back into compliance, of course, we still face the, uh, the reality that China, since it's not a party to the treaty, has something north of 90% of all of its missiles in that intermediate range, as Admiral Harris pointed out to the Armed Services Committee recently. Uh, but I think at a minimum, we have to take the steps necessary to bring Russia back into compliance with the INF Treaty. First question on North Korea. Um, I don't think it's time to abandon yet the effort to try to um, encourage Beijing to bring more pressure there on Pyongyang. There are steps that we have not yet taken that we can take. For instance, the threat of secondary sanctions against Chinese businesses, institutions, and individuals who are key facilitators for North Korea. Um, there are also ste direct steps that we can take about North Korea, like relisting them as a state sponsor of terrorism or cutting the, cracking down again on some of their financial institutions like we did in the last decade against Bank of Delta Asia, but in a misguided effort to try to reach a negotiated outcome with North Korea, we lifted those things. So I commend President Trump and Secretary of State Tillerson for undertaking these efforts with China. I don't think they've yielded fruit yet, uh, but I think they're worth, consider, worth pursuing further. Right behind Christina. Mike's coming right behind. Hi, Senator. I'm Elizabeth from Congressman Jim Banks' office. It's uh, wonderful to see you here today. Say hi to Jim for me. I will. Um, I have a question about NATO. There has been, um, even in the past six months, and as Montenegro was just um, voted in, questions of its usefulness and effectiveness, even today it's been called a Cold War relic, um, but we've seen them actually step up exercises and involvement over the next few months in response to Russia. So with Congress kind of playing uh, on the side of NATO and the administration has questioned it, as the president's talked about, the GDP, the 2%. Um, what are your thoughts on the usefulness for NATO and how we could see our involvement and encouragement to our allies, especially in Eastern Europe, just grow over the next six months? No, NATO is still vital to our national security. As I, as I said at the outset, a, a fundamental premise of American grand strategy since before we were a country is the defense of our homeland and our citizens. And every citizen in every, all 50 states deserve, under our Constitution, equal protection uh, from those kinds of threats. And we have all those bases, not just in Europe, but in the Middle East and in East Asia, and the entire Eurasian rimland, uh, in part, to forward defend. So our military plays road games. They don't play home games here on U.S. soil. Um, many of the countries in NATO are relatively small, and they're not wealthy countries. They're not going to contribute, you know, 10 divisions to our military, uh, to our military efforts. However, they are vital things they can contribute through their geopolitical position and through accesses or insights that they may have. Uh, that's one reason why we have NATO and we have all those bases overseas. President Trump is very right uh, that our NATO allies, though, need to spend the amount of money that they all, we all pledged to each other a few years ago uh, and that too many have not been doing. The most important countries are the larger, richer ones, like Germany. Uh, it'd be nice if the smaller, poorer countries in NATO spent enough uh, to meet that commitment as well. But again, if you're a country of a couple million people and a relatively limited economy,
economy, you're not going to field 10 mechanized divisions. The larger countries, though, can make a real difference. And ultimately, deterrence is not about uttering magic words. It's not a political matter. Deterrence is a military matter. And Vladimir Putin knows, just like aggr aggressors always know, that no words backed up or not backed up by action mean anything. So it's much, it would be a much greater deterrent if NATO spent the 100 to $120 billion every year that it hasn't been spending because our European allies are not matching their commitments than anything that any national leader could say. I think we had Marvin Ott and then Dave Majumdar. Um, thank you, Senator. Uh, Marvin Ott, formerly federal government, now Johns Hopkins and the Wilson Center. Uh, I'd like to probe your knowledge of the technology on the missile defense uh, side based on, you know, you, you have privileged access to uh, a world that I once worked in but no longer do. Uh, and the, the pr prelude to that is I take your point that there are still screws to be turned potentially on pressure on North Korea. But we've been at this for well over 20 years. We've tried a variety of approaches. We've been trying to use sanctions as a route to bring the North Koreans around for a very long time. Uh, it gives grounds for someone, someone like me to be ultimately pessimistic that that's going to be a viable route. And what you're left with then, I think, is your topic, which is missile defense. And I'm just, I wonder if you can say anything about you know, the techno technical challenges in this world are huge. The complexities are mind-numbing. How good are we and how good can we get? So first, on the, on the geopolitical point about North Korea, as, a, as I mentioned earlier, I think there are steps that can be taken that have not yet been taken uh, to bring pressure to bear on North Korea. You know, China made a show earlier this year of cutting off coal imports, uh, which didn't really have much impact. Um, North Korea gets refined petroleum products, though, almost exclusively from China. Uh, if China stopped sending those, you would see uh, basically, you know, within a matter of weeks, North Korea would about, probably be entirely out of gasoline, just to give you one example. So I do think there are geopolitical steps we can take uh, that we haven't yet taken and that we ought to take if China doesn't quit playing both sides uh, in this uh, rivalry. Um, in terms of military technology, uh, I obviously can't go into great detail. Um, and you're right that it is very complex. I also caveat that I'm not a rocket scientist and I barely got through physics in school. However, uh, the experts who do this work uh, at the Missile Defense Agency uh, and more broadly within the Pentagon or outside experts are increasingly confident that with higher levels of investment and more focused leadership in the executive branch uh, and interest and pushing from the Congress, uh, that we are on the cusp of some pretty major breakthroughs, not just in ground-based interceptors, as I mentioned, but, for instance, in airborne laser interceptors. Uh, again, that's very cutting-edge or cu cutting-edge stuff, but um, given the pace of technological innovation, especially in this country, uh, I believe that you know, sooner rather than later we could see a, a genuine and acknowledged effective layered missile defense system that could largely, if not entirely, neutralize uh, the threat from a country like North Korea. We've got Dave Majumdar next. We can get him a microphone. Thank you. Hi, David Jenner. I'm the uh, defense editor for the National Interest. Um, so you mentioned uh, you want to build, eventually build this thing into something that can defend against a peer level threat, which would mean Russia or China. Um, what kind of investment do you see that that would take in order to achieve that? Because, I mean, 100 interceptors are not going to do a lot against uh, the Russian arsenal. I mean, you're talking about hundreds, uh, if not thousands, of interceptors and no guarantee of success. I mean, it almost invites a, a kind of a situation where they might be, you know, even if they perceived the threat, to launch for a strike if we were going to do some of that. Uh, and the second point was uh, also uh, with uh, the INF Treaty, uh, the Europeans are still threatened by Russian you know, ground-based cruise missiles and ballistic missiles in that case. I mean, we may not be threatened, but they are. I mean, that's kind of a problem because we're also, we may not have that skin in the game, but they do. So, I mean, what can we do to reassure our NATO allies that uh, that we're going to, you know, like do something to defend them in that sort of situation? 
So your first question, uh, you're right that it would be a large investment of resources. That's one reason why I say the Budget Control Act must be repealed, among many other reasons. Um, but we won't know until we continue the technological development. Uh, again, with the pace of technological innovation in this country, um, with the possibility of advanced space-based systems, uh, I do believe that we can that we can one day get to a uh, layered system that would make the United States homeland uh, protected against these kind of threats. It's going to be longer than it would take to get to North Korea, as we were just talking about, but I do think it's technologically feasible. Um, I don't want to get into more details, though, about the kind of uh, co you know, cost estimates I've seen. Second, on the INF Treaty, of course Europeans are threatened uh, by intermediate range missiles for the same reason that Europe is. That's why Europeans should support our efforts to try to bring Russia back into compliance with the INF Treaty. Those missiles are being driven around Russia right now, uh, and they could strike uh, any European capital with virtually no warning. Uh, so European countries, rather than suggesting that we look the other way or bury our head in the sand or try to you know, talk more uh, and um, take no action, uh, should be supporting the kind of legislation that I have, which is designed within the current parameters of the INF Treaty to put pressure on Russia to come back into compliance. All right, we have time for maybe one brief question, if possible. Please. The microphone's coming for you, sir. Senator, that was a fine presentation. And from an uh, old Cold War military guy, it, uh, all those increases in our nation's uh, military capability it warms my heart. But I'm also a guy that balances his checkbook every month. I know that's a quaint concept uh, in modern government, but um, with a, somewhere in the neighborhood of a $20 trillion national debt and uh, entitlement spending on upward vectors with 10,000 boomers uh, adding to those roles on a daily basis, how, how are you going to pay for all of that? Just Listen. for the record, our, our Chairman Chuck Boyd, everybody. <laughs> General, it's a very good question, um, and then it goes far beyond the topic we're addressing here on ballistic missile defense. Um, I would say, though, as a general matter, um, our, our defense budget is not the cause of our deficits or the cause of that $20 trillion in debt. Um, and if anything, it helps make that deficit and that debt more manageable in the long term because it keeps open international lanes of commerce and keeps our people and our assets protected. Inevitably, when we try to balance the budget on the back of the military, as we did immediately following the demise of the Soviet Union, as we did over the last eight years, our enemies catch up with it, as they, ha as they did to us on 9-11, or as you're seeing around the world now, and we end up spending even more money than we would have, often on a crash course, often on things that we wouldn't have had to spend them on had we simply maintained higher steady state operations. Further, on our strategic forces, um, I have sometimes heard the objection that we shouldn't spend so much money on weapons that we never use. Uh, I would dispute both premises of that statement. One, we don't spend that much money on our strategic forces. It's only about 3 or 4 percent of the total defense budget. And two, we use our nuclear forces every single day, and we have for 73 years uh, because they help deter that existential threat to our homeland. But your point is very right about the need to get our fiscal house in order. Uh, the most immediate and fundamental thing we can do is get our economy growing once again at a rate that's much higher than, you know, 1.5 to 2 percent that it has been. President Trump obviously has prioritized that uh, through regulatory action, but Congress is working on it as well. Um, we're looking at health care legislation uh, this week that might have the impact of making Medicaid, for instance, one of our the three big drivers of our national debt more financially stable in the long term while delivering an equal or greater quality of care to the most vulnerable populations that have needed it since its inception. But you're right about, you're right about the uh, challenges that we face from our debt. I would just say that our military, so far from being a cause of that debt, is actually uh, something that helps keep it within manageable levels by, keeping, by protecting peace and prosperity, not just here in the United States, but around the world. All right, well, that concludes part one. If we can get a, a hand for Senator Cotton. Thank you very much, Senator. Thank you so much. Thanks for doing it. So if we could have Joe and Rebecca come join us, we'll jump on to round two.
Yes. <laughs> All right, well, welcome to round two of our discussion on missile defense. Next, we have two presentations that showcase very important and I think very different perspectives on U.S. missile defense policy. Both speakers will present their views for about 10 minutes each, which should leave us probably a good amount of time for Q&A. And just like the last Q&A, please present your name and affiliation. We are on the record. We have a lot of cameras from C-SPAN, Facebook Live, so it's always great when people know who they're hearing from. Uh, so with that, let me bring in our first speaker to my right, Joe Srencion, president of Plowshares Fund, a global security foundation. He's the author of the new book, Nuclear Nightmares, Securing the World Before It Is Too Late. It's a romance novel. Sounds like it. <laughs> uh, he previously served as president for national security and international policy at the Center for American Progress and director for nonproliferation at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And I, I happened to watch you yesterday on Fried Sicaria, so congratulations on that. Oh, thank you. Joe, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me here. And we have 10 minutes each. Is that correct? Yes. Good. So just cue me up, and I'm getting near the end of that. You and got I'll it. St I'll stop. Uh, it's a lot to say in, in, in 10 minutes. I uh, basically disagree with everything Senator Cotton said, except that it was nice to be here. Uh, I represent sort of the other uh, side of this. And let, let me focus my remarks primarily on, on missile defense, the, the point of this, this session. I have been in Washington working on national security for about 35 <laughs> years. It's a pleasure. I've known Dimitri for almost all that time and Jeff, for, Jeff Kemp for about all that time. A big part of that was focused on missile defense beginning in 1983 when President Reagan launched the uh, Strategic Defense Initiative. Uh, I was uh, I joined the staff of the House Armed Services Committee in, in late 1984 and was assigned oversight responsibility. So I've been tracking these programs uh, ever ever since. So let me state very clearly and, com and fully that I am, I am strongly in favor of an effective national missile defense system for the United States. Who wouldn't want an effective national missile defense. If you could reliably protect the American people from ballistic missiles, this most, the, mo the only existential threat that we have besides climate change, who wouldn't want that? I want it. I also want a cure for cancer. I would also like a really good light beer. But some things are beyond our technological capability, <laughs> and an effective missile defense is one of them. It's not for lack of trying. We've spent $330 billion on missile defense over the last decades. $330 billion. We've had our best contractors, our best scientific minds focused on this. We have been pushing this. It is not, as Newt Gingrich said in his contract on America in the 1994 election, when he could, these only, the only one of his 10 points on, uh, in his contract on America on national security was about this, was about missile defense. It's not because we lack the political will. That's been the, the critique, that we haven't been trying hard enough. No, 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 we've been trying. Republicans and Democrats have been trying. Since, since uh, uh, the 1980, Republicans have held the president to the executive branch for about half that time, for about half that time. It's been evenly split, a little more on the side of, of Republicans, a actually. And they have been trying to push this. The result has been that every major national missile defense si system we tried to produce has failed. It has not worked. And we're left with this system, the ground-based ballistic missile system, or GMD, ground, or GMD, ground-based missile defense. This is the system Senator Cotton talked about, the 44 interceptors that will be in Alaska and California by the end of this year. This system does not work. It cannot protect the United States from a sophisticated, even North Korean ballistic missile attack. And here's why. The problems with ground-based ballistic missile defense were detailed in the 1980s by the proponents of the SDI program, the proponents of the Star Wars. We had to go to space. You remember those cartoons, those of you who were around then. The cartoons are these weapon satellites shooting Star Wars-like lasers out and blowing up uh, incoming warheads like popcorn. 
you needed to go to space because ground-based ballistic missile defense was inherently flawed, inherently flawed. It would not work. I have Daniel Graham's book, Promoting High Frontier, from back in 1982, 1983. I went at the Center for Strategic and International Studies to Daniel Graham's early lectures. I thought he was nuts then, but his comments on ballistic missile defense on the ground were absolutely spot on. Number one. A ground-based missile system can be easily overwhelmed. It is far cheaper for the offense to proliferate warheads than it is for the defense to proliferate defenses. It's a simple task. That's why we were never worried about the Soviets deploying a ballistic missile defense around Moscow. They had 100 interceptors. We just targeted 200 warheads. We were never worried about our ability to penetrate those defenses. Number two, and most important, as Daniel Graham says, the farther away the targets are, the higher up, the harder it is to discriminate between the real warhead and the decoys. A ground-based missile defense system cannot discriminate between a warhead and a decoy. It couldn't do it in 1993. It still can't do it. That's why none of the tests of this system have actually been tested against realistic decoys. Realistic decoys, meaning decoys meant to look exactly like the warhead. We've had some tests where there's a big, big, big fat balloon and a tiny warhead. That you can do. But something where the, where the opponent is really determined to spoof you. In fact, until the last test, we've had 18 tests. The last one of this system was the first one where we tested against an actual ICBM target, one that was actually ICBM range, even at the lower end of that range. Other than that, they've been slower, easier to hit targets. And the reason we don't test against effective countermeasures is because we can't see. We can't discriminate. We can't hit the system. But, and here's the final flaw of the ground-based ballistic missile defense system, says Daniel or Graham and others such as the George C. Marshall Institute. Even if you could fix that, even if you could discriminate, even if you could deploy hundreds of effective interceptors, your system is still vulnerable in its soft nodes. Its radars can be attacked. As you know, the beginning of any air campaign is to suppress the enemy's defenses. That would be true for ballistic missile as well. You would suppress the enemy's defenses. You would attack their radars. You would blind the system by simple means, such as North Korean frogmen blowing up some of the, the, the forward deployed air defenses, or by ballistic missile attack on, on, the, on the radars themselves, or by other means. Fine. So that's the problem we have with some of this. That's and it's, it's a confusing subject because so much of us are confused by the benefits of short-range ballistic missile defense. See, that we can do with some success. You can build a short-range system to shoot down scuds, things that go 300 kilometers, 600 kilometers, maybe 1,000 kilometers. You can do that with some reliability. I spent a year of my life investigating the performance of the Patriot missile in the Gulf War, the Gulf War of 91. They said it, effect, it hits 41 out of 44, said George H.W. Bush. No, it did not. Believe me, the Patriot system did not work. It was not designed for the job it was given. We estimated it hit somewhere between zero and four of those scuds. But the Patriot could be fixed, and to the Army's credit, they've done a very good job of fixing that Patriot, a new, much more capable system, new softwares, new, a new interceptor. And so I think the Patriot does give you a pretty effective defense against short-range targets. The Aegis system on our Navy's cruisers and destroyers gives you a pretty effective defense against short-range. It's only when you go long-range that you really get, the, get those problems. And this is what THAAD will encounter if it tries to intercept intermediate-range ballistic missiles. Once you're in space where everything is the same weight, where there is no friction, then you cannot distinguish between the warhead and the balloons, the chaff, the jammers that can be deployed. The 1999 National Intelligence Estimate s concluded that any nation capable uh, on ballistic missile defense throughout the United States, the 1999, 1999 NIE, said that any nation that could build an ICBM capable of hitting the United States could deploy any one or more of six basic countermeasures. So that's why when people say, and you hear some generals say this, that the, the ground-based missile defense system can provide protection to the United States from a limited ballistic missile attack. That's what they mean, a limited attack, no countermeasures. This system will only work if the enemy cooperates, if the enemy gives us a target that we expect. Th and that's why, and the problem is our testing has been so unrealistic. It's been from one site, Kwajalein Island. We know the trajectory. We 
We know the velocity. We know what the system looks like. Everything is set up. These are, as they say in the trade, strap-down chicken tests. <laughs> and you kill a, a strap-down chicken, and you think, I can kill chickens. Oh, really? <laughs> Go catch one. Go shoot it when it's <laughs> 200 yards away. And that's your problem here. This is a system that's been designed for contract success, to keep the money going. So that's why you cannot rely on this system. So why do people keep promoting it? Well, I think some people don't know. I think they, 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 don't, they don't know this thing doesn't work. They haven't spent the time. They haven't really examined the tests, which is why my solution to this, which I'll give you at the very end, might be a way to settle this debate. But some are driven by ideology. The ideology, and this is a beginning of the missile defense debate. People rejected the idea of arms control. We will not allow the security of this nation to depend on a piece of paper. They do not believe that you can control these weapons by, by treaties eliminating them, even though Ronald Reagan did it with the INF Treaty and eliminated an entire class. Even when it happens, they don't believe it. And so therefore, we have to rely on technology. We have to rely on our own military might. That's why you hear Senator Cotton in full Cold War mode abrogate the treaties, abandon any effort to limit weapons with, with Russia, full-on deployment of new nuclear weapons in Europe, proliferate missile defense. Missile defense will save us. You think we have trouble with our European allies now? Start deploying nuclear weapons in Europe and see what happens. Remember what happened in the 1980s. This would be a disaster. The course that Senator Cotton is advancing is, is not only prone, to, is not, will not only fail, it will make our situation infinitely more dangerous, infinitely more dangerous. We have nothing to gain by abrogating the International, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, and a whole lot to lose. I wish missile defense worked. I wish we could do this, but as Dwight D. Eisenhower said, the awful arithmetic of the atomic bomb does not permit of any such easy solution. Should you keep trying? Yes, you should. Should you deploy systems that don't yet work? No, you should not. We, since we began deploying these ground-based interceptors in 2004, it has a success rate of only 40, of only 50% since 2004. So that even in these strapped-down chicken tests, it fails half the time. And the reason is this is really hard to do. It is really hard to hit it with a, a bullet with a bullet. And it's amazing that we can do it at all even under pristine, ideal conditions. And yet, it still fails 50% of the time. We know that the kill vehicles, someone mentioned this, the kill vehicles that are deployed in about a third of these interceptors don't work very well. There's a fundamental flaw, and yet we have them. So a third of these interceptors we know don't work. And there's problems with even the replacement uh, kill vehicle, but we'll see, it shows more promise. Even if you, do, if you take the best record since 2010, since 2010, we still, <laughs> when you think at the Beatles say, it's getting better all the time. No, this system is not getting better all the time. It's got a 50% failure rate since 2004. It has a 60% failure rate since 2010. We've now had two successful tests in a row. That's good. In the, in the 18 tests that we've had, we've had two, three successful tests in a row, followed by two, three failures. So how do you settle this? How do you decide? If, Rebecca's right, she's about to say that everything I said is completely wrong and foolish and dangerous, or I'm right. Let's have an independent commission examine this. This is the way we settled well the directed energy weapons, the space-based weapons, the original Star Wars weapons, whether they could actually be built. The American Physical Society did a study in 1987 that said it would take 20 years before we would know whether such weapons were ever feasible. It was at that point then Congress decided to pull back on those programs, go for a much more limited defensive system. And the debate over whether the Star Wars type systems could work was essentially over. That's what we need now. We're never going to solve this in Congress. Let's put together an independent commission or ask the American Physical Society to assess the feasibility of ground-based ballistic, ballistic missile defenses to defend the United States from a, a, a limited or a large-scale ballistic missile attack. Let's get some scientists involved who don't benefit from defense contracts, who aren't at institutes benefiting from defense contracts, who don't have an ideological bent to them. And then the American public can decide whether they should rush ahead 
with this fatally flawed system or wait until we can perfect something that might actually work before we deploy it. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Joe. Well, Joe, I, I, phrase of the day, strap down chicken tests. I will, I will remember that one. I'm going to use that in a piece, I promise. I'm going to steal it from you. Okay. okay. So next we have a, a different perspective, and that will be taken on by Rebecca Heinrichs from the Hudson Institute. She's a fellow there. Um, Rebecca has served an advisor on military matters and foreign policy to Representative Trent Franks, member of the House Armed Services Committee, and she helped uh, launch there the Missile Defense Caucus. She's testified before Congress. She's a regular on, on TV. She's on Fox News, CNN, and many other outlets, uh, published very widely in, in National Interest, Real Clear Defense, many other outlets. Rebecca, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm going to share this with okay. you. Rather than um, kind of digging right in and responding to some of what Joe said, I'm just going to go ahead and give my remarks, and then hopefully we'll be able to kind of go back and forth a little bit and dig in where there's some of the um, uh, major points of disagreement. Um, missile defense systems, and by that I mean the entire suite of missile defense systems. So Joe talked a lot about uh, GMD, that's actually ground-based mid-course defense system. I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about sort of just the whole entire concept of what the United States is trying to do. Um, yes, there's GMD, that's the only currently deployed ballistic missile defense system that can protect the United States homeland from an inter intercontinental ballistic missile without GMD, we have nothing there. We also have the Aegis weapon systems with a family of SM3 interceptors, THAAD and Patriot along with their associated sensors, radar. Um, and they are all, they are currently deployed and integrated as part of um, the U.S. military operations. These systems complement offensive weapons, both strategic and conventional, uh, to deter the launch of enemy missiles and, if deterrence fails, to defeat those missiles mid-flight before the missile reaches its intended target. That is the purpose of the, of the systems. At one time, the concept of missile defense was controversial. There was disagreement about whether the systems could work and whether or not they would be a stabilizing contribution to the U.S. strategic posture. But I'm happy to report, actually, there is broad bipartisan consensus, broad consensus within the scientific community that the hit-to-kill technology that is central to U.S. missile defense, in fact, is proven and does work. Um, now the disagreement um, among the consensus community uh, relies on at how fast do we deploy these systems, where do we invest, how do we prioritize, um, and what does the inventory look like moving forward, balancing some of our resources. Um, et cetera. Um, recent tests point to the success of some of the technical aspects of the programs. We've just recently seen successful tests on a couple of the systems. Uh, the only system deployed to defend the U.S. homeland, as I said, the GMD system successfully intercepted for the first time an ICBM class target with countermeasures. Um, this is, uh, so this was um, uh, under very realistic conditions, short of uh, launching it from North Korea at our own homeland, um, you know, we have to take into consideration safety precautions in clearing the seas, et cetera, but um, despite what some um, uh, hit-to-kill deniers say, uh, the military, um, the Missile Defense Agency, along with um, Pacific Command and everybody else who was involved in that test, did not have the exact time when the launch would take place. Um, they just had a window, and they were, in fact, able to successfully hit that, discriminate against um, what was not the, the actual warhead and what was the mock warhead, and, and um, successfully hit that target. And the SM-32A, the cooperative system with the Japanese, had a successful intercept in February of this year. Um, so yes, the most recent one missed, but again, these are tests, and so we test and we point out uh, areas where we need improvement and we build on those tests and we don't quit <coughs> until we actually have um, increased the credibility and the reliability of these systems. And so um, there's a lot to be uh, excited about with the SM3 family of, of interceptors as well. Um, and then back to the bipartisan point, in fact, uh, the term missile defense appeared over 20 times in the 65-page Obama Administration 2010 and, uh, Nuclear Posture Review, or about once every three pages of text. Uh, so the Obama Administration, while starting its first term significantly cutting missile defense, including, as Senator Cotton talked about, that boost phase element, which um, I think he rightly described as the holy grail of missile defense. That's because you can intercept an enemy missile before it can release its decoys and countermeasures. Um, so that's really where you want to get it. Um, he, he, although he cut those boost phase missile defense programs and he cut the GMD program in half, um, he did restore funding to, to GMD um, in, the, in his um, latter half of, of his time in the White House. 
um, and initiated the deployment of the 14 additional ground-based interceptors to Alaska. And those were the same ones that he cut this first year in office. Uh, the administration also initiated the phase adaptive approach to missile defense in Europe. The former changes, the, those changes to missile defense was in response to the quickly expanding, um, the GMD changes were in response to the, cha to the quickly uh, progressing North Korean missile program. Um, that's what just, that's what changed the administration's mind and they made that announcement that they're going to actually now deploy those uh, 14 GBIs and reinvest in missile defense and actually look at uh, a third missile defense site um, in the, on the East Coast or the Midwest of the United States. Um, and then the EPAA was in response to the Iranian ballistic missile threat to Europe. Um, but also the commitment to EPAA and to give the administration, the Obama administration credit, um, it, it stuck with those first two phases even though it, it eliminated that last fourth phase of the European phase adaptive approach due to um, Russian complaints. It stuck with those initial phases because um, because of the threat uh, of Iranian ballistic missiles and because our European allies wanted them and it was demonstrating a great commitment and assurance to our allies in the face of provocations from Russia. Russia, of course, con continues to um, oppose those European missile defense sites. Um, so what happened here, um, aside from just the, the, the change in the threat, I, I mean, I would, I would actually say that the threat wasn't really a change, but it was enough of, a, enough of an uptick that even persuaded um, the most uh, staunch uh, missile defense skeptics in the White House to change it. But it was the threat that drove the military requirements, which is the way it should be. It should not be ideology. Um, that I agree with my friend Joe. Um, but it should be based on what, does the th what is the threat telling us? Um, and then those drive military requirements and then we work on the technical capabilities and then we work to plug in those military requirements which is how we've actually um, done uh, missile defense. Um, and, and all of the threats from missiles continue to grow uh, worldwide and this is because despite arms control and counterproliferation efforts, missiles worldwide are still improving and spreading. Um, and we have entered a new and dangerous era of missile threats marked by missile improvement in range, survivability, and mobility, anti-ship missiles of various kinds, hypersonics, of course, and anti-satellite weapons. So missiles are not merely reserved for those nations with cutting-edge military technologies. Missiles provide a relatively inexpensive way for countries whose militaries are far less sophisticated than that of the United States to deny access to contested areas and to hold at risk U.S. assets, allies, and the U.S. homeland itself. Don't take my word for it. Um, in the last couple of days, the Pentagon just released to Congress a new um, assessment on the threats to, to the United States, and it said, quote, many countries feel ballistic and cruise missiles are cost-effective weapons and symbols of national power, end quote. That is driving um, the need for missile defense worldwide is this explosion of ballistic missile technology. Um, and then it, uh, the report goes on to assess the, uh, um, both Russia's um, capabilities, North Korea's, China's, um, and Iran's. What this means is even if one does not really believe that an enemy's being in possession of a nuclear ICBM, <coughs> um, for instance, out of North Korea, that it will necessarily employ the nuclear ICBM merely by possessing the capability will inhibit the United States, restrict our military, and our options in response to a variety of kinds of aggression. Therefore, taking away the enemy's ability to credibly threaten the United States with a nuclear missile dramatically enhances the ability of the United States to conduct its foreign policy as policymakers see fit. We have to close those deterrent gaps. By leaving the United States exposed, we are creating an incentive for our enemies to actually develop capabilities to hold those assets at risk. Um, as the, the Senator uh, so eloquently stated, there is now underway a great bipartisan effort. This is not a Republican effort. This is a bipartisan effort in the Senate um, to expand um, both in inventory and also just investments in these programs. Um, that's across the entire spectrum of missile defense systems from Aegis to the ground-based mid-course defense system. Um, I am in um, firm agreement that, especially on the heels of this great successful um, intercept test of GMD, now is the time to actually increase the number of ground-based interceptors. We already have um, space in Alaska and in California to actually deploy those interceptors. Um, and so as we've continued to improve the technology, we should continue to test um, rigorously, uh, but that we shouldn't wait until um, the system um, of course is perfect because our enemies are not. Uh, General uh, Hyten just gave a great talk um, a couple of days ago uh, comparing the way the United States does acquisition versus <laughs> North Koreans. The North Koreans are just quickly trying to actually get their offensive systems <coughs> to work. So that's why you see all of these you know, missiles blowing up on the launch pad. They don't get discouraged like we do. We have a missed intercept test and we think, oh no, and then you, know, you have people looking to cut the program. The North Koreans are determined to actually have the capability and so what they're doing is they're testing 
they're having um, setbacks and some other tests, but they're learning where those mistakes are, and then they're applying that, um, that new knowledge um, in order to actually improve the capability. Um, I would suggest that the United States needs to take more of that approach to getting our defensive systems right. Um, so I won't go into too much of the detail because the Senator did that in terms of what's in his bill. Um, but there's also a great bipartisan effort in the House of Representatives. Um, there's a lot of Democrats that are very interested in not having their states and their constituents held at risk of a nuclear ICBM. Um, and so uh, they are working um, hard to make sure that we have a robust and credible missile defense system. And the last thing I'll point out before we get into questions. Um, very important, last year the Congress, again, both the Senate and the House, bipartisan effort, amended the 1999 National Missile Defense Act to strike limited from it. So now it's not the goal of the United States. It was never the goal, but it was stated uh, the, the way that the, the bill, the way that the law was written, it sort of left the impression to the Pentagon and to the Missile Defense Agency that the United States was only to build a missile defense system to defend against limited ballistic missile attacks. But actually, the United States has always been able to build a missile defense system as it sees fit. Um, so limited was the sort of the baseline, it was not the ceiling. And so now Congress has, um, I think, prudently amended that law, and so now it str has, um, has stricken the word limited, so that now the United States is just uh, free to build a missile defense system um, um, based on uh, the threat and uh, can sort of go forward in terms of increasing um, the technology qualitatively um, and then the, uh, the number of systems that we have deployed in the inventory quantitatively. And that, uh, um, I would suggest, includes expanding GMD, expanding the Aegis weapon system, expanding THAAD, um, and then also getting a space-based sensor layer so that we have birth-to-death tracking of these missiles, so that we have a better idea of um, you know, where these missiles are headed and, and what's on them, um, and then eventually um, having a kinetic kill capability on those space-based sensors, um, which would provide the United States with the optimal vantage point of intercepting missiles in the boost phase of flight. So in conclusion, I would just say that while it is a shame that it's taken so long, and it has been such a political battle to get us where we are in terms of technical capability, and that is because of the political um, fight that we have had, that um, we have much to be grateful for and much to be optimistic about um, in terms of the missile defense systems deployment um, and also the, the increasing, the, the, the current political consensus we've actually fought for and um, continue to grow. Okay. All right, thank you, Rebecca. So now the fun begins with Q&A. Once again, just please state your name and affiliation because we are on the record. David Jumdar, you are first, and then we'll go to you, Eric. Uh, David Drummer from the National Interest. Um, so this is a question for both you and uh, both Rebecca and uh, Joseph. Um, what do you consider to be uh, like a non-scripted test? Because y this test, this last one, technically <coughs> you're right. It did have a window that didn't really know when it was coming, but they did have pre-positioned and typically two radars in the spots where they were supposed to be. That this the sea-based X-band radar position where it needed to be. All these things need to be deployed in the right spots and need to be tied in. I was just actually at Northrop's uh, BMB facilities last week. Actually, it was, yeah, it was last week. And um, basically, they can tie it all together. That's all true. The problem is, without those uh, advanced uh, forward deployed uh, radars and whatnot, you actually can't shoot this thing. So you have to have these things pre-positioned around the world, and uh, you have to know something's coming before you actually shoot. So without the space-based element of this already in place, I mean, how do you, what, I mean, what do you consider to be a fully you know, like a real system that can actually defend the country without any sort of advance notice. I mean, uh, you're actually kind of generous. Let me start. That. Let me start. Look, if you're serious about this, if you are a warrior, if you are a politician that wants to protect the American people, you don't put, deploy a Potemkin defense. You don't deploy something that's made to look like a defense so that it makes people feel better, because that is dangerous. You will then enter into combat situations. You will, you will escalate a conflict with an enemy thinking that you can actually defend against them when you can't. This puts American lives at risk. This puts troops' lives at risk. So you want to test something? Do it the way the military knows how to do. Red team it and blue team it. Let's get a red team up who actually designs the target side that puts something up that is intended to stress the weapon system being tested. And then you have a blue team who knows nothing about the target, who say, who maybe you give them a window, of course, you have to have certain limitations here. It's going to come this week. It's going to come this day. And then let's go try it. And they don't do that. And that is dangerous to America. That
That is not the way we should be buying our weapons. Do you want to deploy something on an emergency basis? If you had one of these, these GBIs, this interceptor, because you thought the North Koreans actually had a weapon that could hit us, they do not right now, but they're working on it. You let the North Koreans just do what they're doing, they will have an ICBM with a thermonuclear warhead that can hit Seattle or Los Angeles in the next four or five years. That's my estimate. The North Korean threat is coming. So do you need an emergency defense, something blast, stab? Yes, but treat it that way. Understand that this is an emergency deployment. This is not an effective defense. And then stress it against what you think the North Koreans actually would do. Chat, piece of chaff, pieces of wire, little low voltage jammer, uh, jammers that would be put out, balloons that look exactly like the, the warhead. Or, um, uh, 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 or even simpler, you just take the, the boost vehicle and you have an explosive rope that blows it up into little pieces. So the warhead's coming at you in space and it's filled with a hundred pieces. You know what the defense has to do? It has to target every single one of those. It can't. So do stuff like that. And then you might have a, a judgment of whether your system is actually going to protect the American people or just protect you in the next election. Yeah, yeah um, I would just say that uh, the, the past several NORTHCOM commanders, four-star combatant commanders, NORTHCOM commanders, have all verified that they believe that the GMD system does provide them with the capability to protect the United States homeland against the threat from North Korean um, um, intercontinental ballistic missiles. Okay, so you know, I'm just. There's that. This has gone. This has expanded. This is not a partisan issue. This has. This has. This has gone beyond um, just one Republican administration, Democratic administration, has spanned the administrations. This last test, in fact, um, by the uh, the director of operational test and evaluation at the Department of Defense, you know, continues to look at this system specifically. And in the past, and it's been tough. This is the system. They, they're only looking at what, the, what what is the system able to do. And they are stressing the system. They are pushing the envelope. They are trying to stress the system to see what it can do. And in the past, it has said that it has a limited capability to defend the United States from um, homeland from the small number of intermediate range or intercontinental ballistic missiles with simple countermeasures launched from North Korea or Iran. That has been what they are comfortable saying the system can do. After this most recent intercept test, it has upgraded its, assess its assessment and has said that GMD has now demonstrated a capability to defend the United States homeland from a small number of intermediate range. It's no longer even limited. It's, it's just struck that word. So you don't have to, I mean, you, we, we, can, we academics can just read sort of open source data and we can just pick and choose what we want to say about the system. But you're talking about the people who are actually looking at the hardware, looking at the system, looking at the sensor data, looking at the threat, the NORTHCOM commanders, the um, Pacific commanders, those at U.S. Forces Korea, in addition to both members of Congress on both sides of the aisle that are getting the highly classified briefings on this. And I'll just say this, in terms of moving the radar where, where it needs to go, we are watching what North Korea is doing. So, yeah, we don't want to be totally caught by surprise, but as they begin to move, we can get sensors and radar where it needs to be in order to get the systems um, ready to go to intercept an ICBM. Can, can I just add, even if you uh, believe what Rebecca just said, and even if you believe the commanders who she quoted, you have to understand that this, in the 18 tests, it's failed 50% of the time. This has a 50% failure rate. You wouldn't get in an airplane that failed 50% of the time why do you put the defense of the United States in the hands of such a system? You are making a great argument for increasing our radars and sensor architecture, which in which I would agree. I mean, my this. Yeah, yeah. I, th those of us who actually are just are we're, those of us who are evidence-based analysts are merely looking at what the system is currently able to do. We have made progress. We're very happy with where it's at. We're not satisfied with where it's at. We would like to expand in, in inventory and in the in the capability. Um, I you know I'm, I I will be the first to say we need more radar and and the MDA has has said that that has not been contested. Um, we need the the LRDR et cetera and we and we need to have space based sensors. Eric Gomez from Cato, excuse me. Hi, uh, Eric Gomez from Cato. So I've been working on a project recently looking at 
missile defense developments and strategic stability with China. And part of that has been going through some declassified CREST documents about historical you know, discussions, declassified discussions within the U.S. government about past missile defense systems such as SDI, such as the system in, systems in the 60s. And one thing that struck out, uh, that stuck out um, in that analysis is that in the past, uh, observers were pretty frank about the impact of missile defense on strategic stability. The idea that if we were to build better missile defenses, then there would be an incentive for the Soviets or for the Chinese to expand their arsenals or invest in the kinds of technologies that, that could defeat it. I don't really hear that in modern debates much. Um, why, I, I'm, I'm curious to hear what the panelists think about, why do we sort of ignore or downplay what, so yes, GMD is intended to be against North Korea or Iran and limited missile threat. However, the more money you put into it, the more interceptors you add, the better interceptors you get, the higher the incentive for countries like Russia and China to develop countermeasures to them. Is that conversation happening in policymaking if circles or is it being ignored? Um, if I may take that one. Um, the reason you don't hear that debate anymore is because it's no longer applicable. That, 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 that conversation applied in the Cold War whenever you had one particular um, enemy in which you were trying to deter, you were worried about upsetting the strategic balance. Because of the proliferation of ballistic missiles, it, that dynamic just, just no longer applies. Moreover, you have the Chinese and the Russians that have been free to develop offensive um, ballistic missile capabilities, um, even though we don't have a defensive system in place. And so um, this fear that, that the, the adversaries are going to be incentivized <coughs> to build offenses in response to our defenses has, in fact, not proven to be the case. They have built offensive systems because of the absence of a defensive system. Um, uh, there, there, you, where, this is what I would call um, deterrence gaps in our system. Where there have been gaps, you have the enemy stepping in there. We, we do not have um, a robust defensive capability against our space assets, and the more we rely on our national security space assets, the more we create an incentive for the enemy to actually target those, those vulnerabilities. So what I have argued is, as you have seen, we, we, we don't need to incentivize our adversaries to, to do what is in their own interests. States act in their interests. China would like to hold the United States at risk, so it will. The it's up to the United States then to respond by closing that deterrent gap that we've allowed to, to remain vulnerable um, uh, because of the you know, ABM treaty um, and then just the lack of policymakers' interest in actually moving in that direction. Um, that's why I think it's so important that Congress had the, the prudence and the insight to actually amend that National Missile Defense Act um, to make it clear that should the United States deem it responsible and technologically, technologically possible to start closing those gaps, that we are free to do that. Deter deterrent gap. I, I, I must. I, I don't think I've heard that. Uh, maybe I haven't been paying attention. Just so you all know, and those of you watching at home, the United States has about 5,000 thermonuclear warheads in its active stockpile. Russia has approximately the same, about 4,000 now. We've come down a little bit. Uh, that's enough to destroy human civilization maybe 20, 30 times over. That's a pretty good deterrent. I don't see any gap in either side. We could easily cut down to a few hundred each and we would still have a robust deterrent. So uh, this deterrent gap is an interesting s slogan. I, I, I don't think it has any relationship at all to the reality of, of, of nuclear weapons. But on the question of a missile defense, this center used to be called the Nixon Center. And Richard Nixon believed in deploying a ballistic missile defense. He supported uh, the Democrat, President Johnson, when he started deploying a limited missile defense in the United States. But he and his Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, understood that if you wanted to stop the arms race, both the U.S. and Russia were racing to deploy thousands of nuclear weapons in the 70s, you had to put a cap on defenses. Because as long as you proliferated defenses, the other side's obvious and cheapest and most effective answer was to proliferate offensive weapons. That's the way you handle a defense. This has been true since castles and catapults. This is the way offense and defense work. So in 1972, when they wanted to limit the offensive weapons of each side, the strategic arms limitation talk, they agreed to the ABM treaty, the anti-ballistic missile treaty, which capped the defenses each side could de de deploy. And that logic held. That logic helped rein in 
the Cold War, and in fact, when neither side, the Russia and the United States, have been deploying defenses, in fact, since Ronald Reagan's day, when he just not only limited but started cutting nuclear weapons, the arsenals have been coming down steadily, steadily. Like I say, we, we, there are about 15,000 nuclear weapons in the world now. There used to be 66,000. So in the world without missile defenses, the numbers have been coming down steadily. That will change if you start deploying defenses. How do we know? Look at South Asia. There's a debate going on in South Asia about missile defense. Both the Pakistanis and the Indians are talking about missile defense systems, are negotiating with various U.S. contractors to help with missile defenses. And what's the answer of the other side? <coughs> we have to build more weapons to overwhelm the defense. So there is a real nuclear arms race underway in South Asia. Now it's being accelerated by the, by the introduction of missile defenses. It's pouring gasoline on, on the fire. And, and so this debate has been moribund, has been not happening, because we have not been in a missile defense race. We've just been playing around with these limited defenses, theater defenses. The one place where it is going to flare up is in Europe, this so-called European phased adaptive approach. It was supposed to be aimed at an Iranian ICBM with a nuclear warhead. There is no Iranian ICBM. The Iranian deal has, has, has truncated that program, ensured that there won't be a nuclear weapon for at least 15 or 20 years. And yet, the missile defense systems that we said were aimed at the Iranians are still going in and are about to expand. The Russians say, see, it's about us. It's been about us all along. And in fact, you have some senators who, do, who, who want it to be about Russia. They want to put missile defenses in Europe. You do that, and you've just done what's going on in South Asia. You will pour gasoline on the fire. You will see the proliferation of nuclear weapons okay. in Europe once again. Okay. 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 Just a couple of factual errors there. The European phase adaptive approach started by the Obama administration was not merely to handle an Iranian intercontinental ballistic missile. It is a phase adaptive approach, so it was the deployment of short-range ballistic missile defense systems and to end with, in the fourth phase, the, the SM-32B, which was um, um, unfortunately canceled. Um, but, but it was aimed at Iran. Yes, the entire no. suite, but, but this point is important. Uh, Iranian ballistic missiles still exist, and in fact, regardless, putting aside um, the wisdom of the Iran deal, since that's not what we're here to debate, putting that aside, it did not handle, it did not restrain Iranian ballistic missiles. And even though sanctions still um, forbid the, d the testing of some of these missiles, um, the, the JCPOA does not prohibit the testing of, of Iranian ballistic missiles. The Iranians have continued to increase ballistic missiles. Europe is still at risk currently of short and medium range ballistic missiles. The European phase adaptive approach was to deploy short and medium range defenses in the first two phases. That's what we're doing. That's what we've committed to our allies. And by the way, this is not, I mean, it, it, I, I find it so interesting when hit to kill skeptics continue to say that this is sort of a, a partisan or an ideological question whenever you have actually seen the Israelis, the Japanese, um, the Saudis, um, uh, you know, you have, you have all of these countries that are looking at the capabilities, the same information that we're able to, lo looking at what they're able to do and saying, we want these systems, we want these systems. Um, the South Koreans, um, if I didn't say that. So, you know, missile defense, this is, this is not a matter of ideology, it's just a matter of military requirement. Um, uh, regardless of, of, of what uh, people say in terms of strategic stability, what we have seen is missiles have exploded worldwide. That we are in the middle of a new uh, missile era in terms of uh, quantity and the quality and technical ability of missiles. We have a couple of options. We can actually just choose to remain vulnerable as our adversaries and enemies continue to proliferate and increase and the, uh, the ability of these, of these systems and hold our assets at risk or we can close those gaps. Um, our military and our allies have chosen to close those gaps. So I'm optimistic about um, you know, what this pretends for the future. Um, it has never been made uh, to be the end all be all to, 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 you know, to, to totally and utterly um, make all of these uh, missiles um, you know, unable to target the United States, but it is part of um, an overall U.S. strategic posture to complement offensive, both conventional and nuclear capabilities. All right, Jacob Halbern, have you next. Thanks, Harry. I've been waiting a long time for such a spirited debate to take place at the Buy me Center a beer for the National anytime. Interest. <laughs> so, I recall that when Reagan gave his speech, March 20th, 1983, on SDI, as it was known. He did not consult the State Department and, like Donald Trump, just went out and did it on his own. 
this was an E-Day fix of his for decades. Mm -hmm. The impulse was not to ramp up the arms race. It was, as he put it in his speech, to render nuclear weapons impotent and obsolete. Now, in thinking about our debate here, did Reagan set the bar too high? In fact, what's wrong with having an imperfect missile defense system to strengthen deterrence? Imperfect missile defense systems stimulate the offense. So it leads to an arms race, it doesn't end an arms race. And this has been true almost any place you've seen missile defenses uh, actually be deployed. This is our response. Just look at what we do. When the Soviets started deploying missile defenses uh, in the 1960s, and because we didn't have hit-to-kill technology, these were nuclear-tipped interceptors, 100 around Moscow, our response was to proliferate our warheads. In fact, this is what led to the merving of warheads, putting multiple warheads on one missile so you could overwhelm the defense. So that's the, the danger. If you could have a perfect defense, as I said in the beginning, I would be in favor of it. And, and, I, and, and the promise of SDI, the Star Wars, was that it was going to be that perfect. Ronald Reagan was misled by Edward Teller, who told him that he had back at his lab at Livermore the proof of concept of a system later known as the X-ray laser, the Excalibur experiment, that could, with one weapon, eliminate the entire first wave of SS-18 Soviet warheads as they streaked over the pole. It could hit thousands of targets in one blast. This, of course, was a fantasy. It was never true. I looked at the X-ray laser in depth when I was on the House Armed Services Committee. It, there was no proof of concept. It, like all the other laser and particle beam weapons and speed of light weapons, turned out to be a fantasy, just militarily I impractical, scientifically impractical, economically impractical. But that's why people thought you might be able to do this. It wasn't because they thought we could get better ground-based interceptors or that we could do hit to kill better. That was never the plan. This was always a small, the, uh, 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 tertiary layer of defense in a comprehensive space-based system. We couldn't build space-based, and all the proponents of missile defense are continuing this cargo cult that they have, thinking that some kind of technology is going to come out of the sky and protect us from ballistic missiles. It is not going to happen. Ground-based ballistic missile defense is not going to protect you from ballistic missiles. It will never be perfect. The only way to eliminate ballistic missiles is to eliminate ballistic missiles. You have to have treaties that eliminate things before they can be built. Yeah, I would just say in, in the real world, countries act in their own interests. Arms control, um, just based on the evidence, with all of the arms control and counterproliferations that we've had, counterproliferation efforts that we've had, some of them being um, more successful than others, it has not slowed or stopped the proliferation of ballistic missiles worldwide. Um, this is just reality. This is not ideology. And, and because of that, um, you, you, you have to have, um, again, I have never been a proponent of, you know, un until we get a perfect system or um, that the goal is a perfect system, I don't think that we're ever going to have a perfect system because there's simply too many <coughs> ballistic missiles worldwide. What I have been an advocate for is doing what the military has been doing. I'd like to see them have more um, political backing um, and more backing from policymakers, which I actually think is going to happen under the Trump administration, um, to expand uh, what we have, to build on the progress that we have had. Um, on the space-based system, I would just say there has been studies done. The Institute for Defensive Analysis did a study on this, um, and, um, and they determined that you could have an initial capability, which would be 24 satellites in space, um, over a 20-year life cycle, it costs about $26 billion, and that would give you the ability to intercept ballistic missiles in their boost phase of flight. Um, and that would also, that could also provide some defense of what, um, what I can say in the, that was in the open source, you know, the unclassified report, which is the only one that I've read, um, that it would provide some um, defense of what's being targeted against our um, assets at sea as well. So um, if you think about those areas, you've talked about China um, specifically, um, w we have areas in which there, there's no need to um, antagonize them. They're already doing it. There's no defense against chi what, what China can, can throw at us in terms of strategic ballistic missiles, and they're, all, they're continuing to do that. They're continuing to develop their anti-satellite capabilities. They're continuing to develop their anti-carrier capabilities. They're continuing to develop abilities to, hand to target our, our, our allies in the Pacific and the United States. And so um, the United States can, again, it can allow that to happen or it can work towards closing those gaps. The same with North Korea. The North Koreans 
um, have not been incentivized to target the United States. The North Koreans want to have the ability to hold um, American cities hostage of a nuclear attack. That is what is driving their capabilities and their, their program. It is not because we're, we're creating some sort of destabilizing situation. Um, I find it so interesting how, um, again, Hitchco critics will both say that the system doesn't work and also it's destabilizing. How does a system that doesn't work destabilize anything? Two finger to Joe, and then we'll go to Dimitri. Well, it's like confronting a policeman with a plastic gun. It doesn't work, but it's still a threat to the policeman, so they, they will respond. Uh, just one question on this, uh, one point on this. There has not been an explosion of ballistic missiles in the world. This is not true. There are not more ballistic <laughs> missiles in the world now. There are fewer ballistic missiles in the world now than there were in the 1980s. There are fewer countries with ballistic missile programs now. I'm not than worried about our ballistic missiles. I'm worried about the North Korean ballistic missiles, the Iranian ballistic missiles. So if you're talking about adversary ballistic mis missiles globally, it has exploded. It is expanding no. based on all the. No, I'm afraid Thank not. I mean, you, because part of the reason is we have fewer adversaries, so the people we worried about in the 1980s, a lot of them have, have been d dealt with. For example, we used to worry about an Iraqi ballistic missile program. We don't. Ballistic missiles are a threat, don't get me wrong. It's just not this global threat. So when, when, the, when, the, when the justification for the European missile defense system is now no longer Iran, it's this list of 30 countries with ballistic missiles. You look at the list, almost all of them are our friends or allies. There are a few problem programs we have to deal with. I don't want the Iranians to be testing ballistic missiles. This is their air force. They don't have a very good air force, so this is what they use to threaten Saudi Arabia and people they think are their adversaries. But let's negotiate with Iran to reduce and constrain their ballistic missile capability. I don't want the North Koreans to have a ballistic missile that can threaten the United States. Let's negotiate with the, with the North Koreans to, to put a cap on that program. We have done so in the past with other nations. We have done so with Iran in their nuclear program. This is the only way forward. And see, this is why there's so much emphasis on missile defense. Because missile defense proponents do not want to have negotiations with these other countries. They do not want to have a deal that would somehow legitimize these other countries. One, they don't believe in it, and two, they would rather have regime change on North Korea, regime change on Iran. So you have to examine the whole complex of rationales and discussions for this before you buy the myth that there is a missile defense system out there, or soon could be, that could actually protect us. There is not. So for <coughs> President Dimitri Sachs. <coughs> Joe, thank you for reminding us about our former name, uh, the Nixon Center. And I'm old enough to remember why Nixon decided to negotiate uh, about ballistic missile defenses. And that was not just because of theory of deterrence, not because he was persuaded by Kissinger. You know better than me what was uh, the vote at the Senate in favor of ballistic yes. missile defense. It won by one vote. And uh, in the environment of the Vietnam War, Nixon came to a conclusion, and he wrote about that later, that he had no choice but to negotiate. It doesn't mean that he was wrong, uh, but political considerations were at least as, as important as the deterrent theory. But let me now go in a totally different direction and agree with you. I think that when we're talking about major strategic moves, and that's what we're discussing now, beyond technology. It's a very m major strategic move to change the balance of power. We should ask ourselves not only where we are going to be after our move, but where are we going to be after possible and even likely responses. We're not good at that. We are now preoccupied with Russian interference in American elections. And there is no doubt in my mind that there was Russian interference. Some of us were predicting that interference for years after the United States and the Europeans decided to interfere in the Russian political process, supporting opposition, giving money to anti-Putin groups, uh, publicly and privately pressuring Putin not to run again. Now, I am not in the moral symmetry business, and we were not doing what the Russians have just done because we were doing it openly, and the Russians were doing what they have done secretly. And we wanted to promote democracy, and the Russians wanted to undermine democracy. Having said that, it does not release policymakers from responsibility to think about likely consequences of their actions. And we are now surprised, surprised, 
I have learned about this surprise when I was uh, at a place called Casablanca, mm. at a certain cafe, where there was a certain captain, as you remember, who was shocked, shocked when he has discovered <laughs> that there was gambling. I don't want us to be in this situation again. If we decide to proceed with a major program of improving our missile defenses, mm -hmm. I think we need to do Joe what you have suggested. We need a commission. We need a serious conversation. We have to go beyond technology. I would want to hear, for instance, what are we going to do to avoid inadvertently pushing China and Russia closer together, which would be very much against American strategic interests. Uh, I was interested in Senator Cotton making a point uh, that Russia, as he put it, is in uh, violation of IMF agreement in spirit and mm -hmm. intent. I don't know what does it mean, violation in spirit and intent. Uh, if you have violated an agreement, normally you have violated the agreement. Uh, spirit and intent, it's normally our own interpretation, which is not quite a violation. But what worried me much more was a statement how it would be to our advantage to get out of this agreement, because we would not allow the Cubans to have uh, Russian cruise right. missiles, and we apparently would be able to do it in Europe with impunity. I'm not sure how uh, the Czech ambassador would feel about that. But if I would be Ukrainians, I would be very concerned. Because if Russia comes to a conclusion uh, that allowing Ukraine to go west, to become fully independent, and potentially to join NATO, if they would come to a conclusion that that could mean uh, NATO, American, cruise missiles on Ukrainian territory, it could change Putin's calculations. And let me make one final point. When President Obama was elected, there was a public opinion poll in Russia conducted by a widely respected opposition-minded Levada Center. And the question was, who were most popular international leaders? Number one was still Putin. Slightly behind was President Obama. Today, Putin is still close second, except now number one is Joseph Stalin. And I am quite concerned that we can move into a situation when we would be improving our defenses, but simultaneously provoking very fundamental international processes. And maybe we come to a conclusion that Russia is such an enemy that it doesn't matter anymore what we uh, encourage Russia to do or not to do. But at least I think we have to have a very serious strategic conversation about all of the affairs. Let, let me comment just quickly. First, one, you, you want to solve this debate or at least inform your decisions moving forward, you have to have independent commissions looking at the state of technology of the current missile defense system, evaluating the tests for their realism and, and, and dependability, and give us some baseline so that we can make an informed decision about whether we want to go forward with this missile defense system or whether, in fact, there is another missile defense system that might be better or Number two, you have to, if you're going to make strategic moves with an, a, an adversary, you should at least be trying to have a strategic dialogue with that adversary. This is what we did all during the Cold War. We didn't always agree with the Russians then, and we're not going to agree with them now, but we talked to them. There has to be some kind of dialogue going on. So that, and I would say that's true of North Korea, too, by the way, which is what President uh, Moon Jae-in is going to tell President Trump when he comes to visit later this week. Let's have a dialogue with North Korea. And number three, Three, I don't know why, maybe Rebecca can help us, I don't know why President, uh, Senator Cotton, getting a little ahead of himself there, why Senator Cotton um, believes that Russia needs the INF Treaty more than we do. I believe Russia is in violation of this treaty. They are, are deploying and, and have, have tested before that a new ground-based cruise missile which exceeds the ranges permitted by the treaty. This is a violation. And, and under the agreements we have, we have mechanisms for correcting that violation and pressing to get that, that corrected. It doesn't mean you, that the treaty is now null and void or that we have to abrogate it. We do not want the Russians to have free reign to deploy nuclear weapons again in Europe. We do not want that. It is against our strategic interest. And we don't need to deploy nuclear weapons in Europe. We can hit Russian targets just fine from the systems we have. We don't need it. They do. 
that would be a power play for them to intimidate uh, Europe. And here's just one last thing on the defensive system, the, 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 the launch system that we put in Romania, that we're about to put in Poland. This is a, uh, these are uh, Aegis interceptors, the new version of the Aegis interceptors. And they use the same launch system that we use on Egypt cruisers and, and destroyers. The pr one of the problems with this is that we also launch Tomahawk missiles from that launch system. And one of the things the Soviets keep complaining about is, yes, we're putting defensive systems in there now, but how will they know if we start putting offensive systems in? And I think there's an answer to that, but then they say, well, what if you change your mind and now you have these launch systems put in place and you can quickly put nuclear-armed Tomahawk uh, cruise missiles in there and, uh, and, and threaten us with almost no warning time. Flight time would be something like eight, ten minutes before they hit their targets. So this is a real problem for us that we have to have a dialogue about. I agree with you, Dimitri. Well, I was not so much talking about dialogue. Uh, I was talking more about our own commission. Our own commission. Okay. Thank you. I, I would just say that, you know, I, I, I would agree with you that we need as a country to devote more time, attention, and intellectual capital into thinking about deterrence and thinking about, um, you know, one, two, three steps down, what our actions actually, what the, the effects they have. Because, um, you know, we, we have moved away. We used to invest a lot of intellectual capital in just thinking about deterrence during the Cold War, and we've moved away from that. Um, but I will say, again, you know, Joe keeps talking about how we need to have sort of an objective um, analysis of the current technical capabilities of the systems, but we have that. dot and &E continues to assess and evaluate. Um, they have not... They have not been easy to please. Um, they have been very tough, and they have once again said that the ground-based mid-course defense system does provide the United States with the capability to defend against ICBMs. Um, without GMD, there would be nothing. And so, um, you know, even if it isn't as perfect as we'd like it to be, I would say that we look at the, the, the capabilities that it has and build on that. It makes no sense to move the other direction. Um, and then the, the other point that I would make is, uh, again, you know, I don't, I, I don't know how you can say that this is, again, driven by partisanship or, or some sort of weird conspiracy to help the de defense contractors when you have, um, again, combatant commanders across administrations and uh, democratic administrations that are not um, uh, intuitively in favor of it but then have been persuaded by um, both the threat analysis and the, the briefings on the technical capabilities of the systems to move forward and expand these capabilities, in addition to the evidence provided by our allies. Um, you know, you watch what happens with Israel and the Iron Dome weapon system, and then you can understand why you and our Japanese, why our Japanese and our South Korean allies would say, we would like to have a capability to not to intercept every single weapon that can come our way, but to actually, you know, just um, absorb some of what can happen to us and give the United States the ability to control the escalation a little bit better and, and hopefully um, prevent that from happening in the first place. Uh, these are calculations that countries are making, looking at the evidence themselves, um, and they're all coming to the same conclusion that it makes sense to add defensive capabilities in their overall strategic mixes. Um, and the last point I would make is just that, you know, Russia continues to, to develop its uh, missile defense system. This was not something that was just going on in the Cold War. They are still detonate, you know, they still are, they still have nuclear-tipped missile defenses. They don't do hit to kill like the United States does, and they're still doing it. And you almost never hear from the arms control community um, concern that the, that the Russians are going to upset a strategic balance. It's always beating up on ourselves with our own, off of their own defensive capabilities. Again, you know, I, um, in, a, in a room like this, at this place, you would think it doesn't need to be said, but countries are going to act in their own interests. They're not going to do anything for you. Um, and so uh, North Korea has determined it's in its interest to have a nuclear capability. Um, we have tried across administrations to use diplomacy and to pressure the North Koreans to give up their nuclear program. It has not worked. I am in favor of using diplomacy and every other um, ability that the United States has to try to persuade the North Koreans and to coerce the North Koreans to give up their nuclear program. That has not worked. It, would, it makes no sense to intentionally remain vulnerable when we have a capability, however limited it may be, um, to remain, to keep the, the United States um, homeland vulnerable to North Korea and a nuclear ICBM when they have not been able to be convinced to get rid of their program. Um, you know, each regime is going to act in its own interest. They each have different, different things that they value and different things that they'd like to hold at risk. And so the United States has to take that into account and try to deal with, with those. Um, and arms control simply cannot be the end all be all to handle that, sol that problem. Did you have a question, Mark? No. Dave Mishundar was next. So this is like more of like a very tactical level question. Um, 
so right now we have um, ICBMs, which uh, I don't know, relatively, I mean, they're expensive, but not compared to some of these interceptors. I mean, interceptors are expensive. I mean, and you need more than one to intercept. And you know, with the probability to kill these things, you're going to need more than one. You're going to need two, three, four, five, uh, God knows how many. Well, we don't know. Yeah, we don't know, right? So we're not going to... Hopefully one. Hopefully we won't have to use it at all because it has the deterrent effect. Theoretically, but I mean, like, the chance are even if it goes up, it does, you know, like, like the Sidewinder, for example, just a couple days ago, it missed. I mean, you know, like, mm-hmm. missiles don't hit things. They're not going to hit, they're not hit aisles, right? They're, you know, so anyways, so how ma- at some point, I mean, how do we, uh, how do we get the cost, um, I guess, cost, um, the ratio of, like, basically how much is costing us versus how much is costing them to a reasonable level? I mean, like, this is like, at some point, if we defend, we put up all these sensors, we put up all these missiles, this is going to be a very, very expensive proposition. How do we get to a place where we're not bankrupting ourselves? Yeah, again, again um, I think it's a great question. Um, and a couple points on that. One, I think it's a, uh, I think the, the question we should be asking is how much are we willing to, to, to spend to protect the United States population against these missiles? So it's not, if, if we get fixated on how much is the defensive interceptor cost versus the offensive interceptor, we're going to wind ourselves crazy. Right? But if we look at, what damage can this interceptor do to the U.S. economy and to American lives? That's the calculation we look at. What are we willing to spend in order to make sure that we close that gap? Okay, but now, now I'm going to now I'm going to so that's that's the first question. I would just say that the underlying calculation that you're looking at, the math problem you're looking at, is actually not the right one. The right one is we're talking about defending the U.S. homeland. How expensive it would be if an, if a missile actually hit the United States? What are we willing to spend to actually close that 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 capability gap? Um, but there are things that we can do. I am also a fiscal conservative, um, and I believe that the United States has not always done missile defense the most cost effectively, and that is because we start and stop these programs. We start and stop them. We don't have predictable funding streams. One of the things we can do to get the cost down per interceptor is actually have predictable funding streams to actually invest in and devote significant resources that is predictable so that our contractors can actually uh, predict and assess what we actually need to do. We can keep these lines open um, uh, uh, rather than constantly firing people and hiring people to get um, the production lines um, going again. The other thing we can do is buy more interceptors at once. It's just like anything else. If you buy only a couple here and there, each interceptor is going to cost a whole heck of a lot more money. If you decide, you know what, we've got empty space at Fort Greeley. We've already done the environmental impact study. We already have fields laid out. We already know where we can put the, 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 the silos, but we've got, we, they're empty. They're, they're empty and they're not filled. Um, so there are, it's already ready to go. If we want to put more bullets in the chamber, we can. If you buy more at once, um, each interceptor's cost will go down per item. That's a very smart way to do defense acquisition. It's a very dumb way to continue to stop and start programs. Okay, mm-hmm. but what about the European side? Can the U.S. protect the European by not putting in sites? I think they should. I mean, we can go back and forth and we can spend all day, but the overall question would be, we should, I think uh, we should continue to talk to our allies about investing in their own protection. We are, this administration, I think, is doing great work to, in that regard. We actually are seeing it increases in what our allies are willing to contribute. Um, the Poles want missile defense, and the United States is committed to giving it to them, so we're going to continue working towards that, and, um, and as they can contribute, they should. I think we'll go to Joe. That'll be the final word. Uh, the Poles don't want missile defense. They don't care about missile defense. They want American troops. They want a they want a tripwire. They want a commitment that the United States is dependent. I see the Czech ambassador shaking his head. This is what the Europeans want, especially the Eastern Europeans that have now been brought into the NATO alliance. They want to make sure that they're going to get the same defense that Germany and France get. That there are, there are U, there are U.S. bodies on the line here, and the missile defense plan was offered to them under George W. Bush, and then adapted by by President Obama, and they took it. But you could take those out and, and put a forward deployed battalion there, and they'd be just as happy. They don't care about the missile defense part. The U.S. contractors care about the missile defense part. That's what they're, they're interested in. And here's the other secret. The military doesn't care about a national missile defense system. <laughs> this has always been true. It's not that you're not, it's, not a, it's a nice to have, and if you can do it, they're willing to spend money on it. Let me give you just one brief uh, example. Uh, uh, when President Clinton came in, after all the Reagan Star Wars years, after all the debate about this, he asked the Joint Chiefs of Staff what we should do with the missile defense budget, and they recommended that we cut it to $3.1 billion and that two-thirds of it should be spent on theater missile defense. That's what the military wants. 
They want to protect their troops against the short and medium range threat. And so my proposal for how to handle this is to give the military a bigger say in the budget. The defense budget, despite the best efforts of Rebecca and, and Senator Cotton, is not going to go up as much as it needs to to buy all the weapons currently on order. It is not going to happen. Choices have to be made. Historically, when the Joint Chiefs choose, they do not choose missile defense, they do not choose nuclear, they choose planes and ships and tanks and weapons they really need. So disband the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization, which only exists to be an in-house lobbying shop for defense contracts on this program, disband that and devolve the systems back to the services. Let the Navy decide how many Aegis interceptors we need. Let the Army decide how many THAAD and Patriots we need. Then you would have the forces that you need to make sure we have a balanced defense and are not being propelled into spending ourselves into bankruptcy by a handful of ideologues and defense contractors. All right. Well, I know some of you have been here since 1130, so I think we're going to leave it there. Thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.